Good morning from Helsinki. Uh, welcome to the UNU wider online conference, Development Challenges in Africa in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And welcome to our session four on the new normal and future development of Africa. My name is Rachel Giselquist. I'm a senior research fellow here at UNU wider. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here today to chair this session and to see many of you joining us in the audience. As we've been discussing throughout this conference, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to unprecedented challenges in Africa and around the world on all fronts of development. And over this past year, we've seen significant and worrying impact on African economies, livelihoods, and welfare. In this session, we consider what is the new normal and we turn to the future. So what will this new normal mean for development in Africa? What kind of future do we envision post pandemic? What are key areas of concern and what kind of future do we hope to see and how can we achieve that? I'm very pleased to have three excellent speakers to welcome them in this session to help us reflect on these important questions. Each of them will focus in their opening remarks around a different aspect of the new normal and the future of development for Africa. And then we'll turn to discussion and provide an opportunity for you, the audience, to raise questions. So our first speaker, Ms. Satu Santala, is the Director General for the Department of Development Policy, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Government of Finland. She will focus her remarks on the role of development partners. In addition to her role as Director General for the Department of Development po Policy, Ms. Santala is also Finland's IDA Deputy for the World Bank. Prior to her current role in the ministry, she was Executive Director from Finland at the World Bank, where she represented Denmark, Estonia, Iceland, Latvia, Lithuania, Norway, and Sweden. That's a list. <laughs> Um, she has also held several earlier positions in Finland's Ministry of Government Affairs, including Deputy Director General, Department for Development Policy, Deputy Head of Mission, Embassy of Finland in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Deputy Head of Mission, Embassy of Finland in New Delhi, India. And she's held numerous roles with the Finnish Red Cross, including International Training Coordinator. Our second speaker will be Dr. Desiree Venkata Shalom whose remarks will focus on domestic resource mobilization in the wake of COVID-19. He is director of the Resource Mobilization and External Finance Department of the African Development Bank, which oversees the African Development Fund, partnerships, trust funds, and co-financing. He has also served as director of the Operational Policies Department and director of the Research Department of the African Development Bank. Prior to joining the bank, he was Professor of Economics at HEC Montreal, the University of Montreal, Canada. And he holds a PhD in Economics from Queen's University, Canada. Our third speaker will be Professor Juguna Ndungu, who will speak on emerging opportunities. Professor Ndungu is the Executive Director of the African Economic Research Consortium based in Kenya. Before joining the AERC, he held the position of governor of the Central Bank of, of Kenya from 2007 until 2015. And prior to this, he held positions with the African Economic Research Consortium, uh, the University of Nairobi, the International Development Research Center, and the Kenya Institute of Public Policy Research and Analysis. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. So a very warm welcome to our three speakers. So without further ado then, let us turn to our excellent panel. Um, I would like to begin first by inviting Director General Satu Santala to make her remarks. Thank you, Rachel. And, um, and it's a great honor to be with you here um, today. Uh, in this uh, virtual event. Um, so a few remarks uh, from the perspective um, of the role of development partners going forward. Um, and um, I will go through my remarks um, looking at it from um, the perspective of what happened in the past few months, what have we learned and what's the emerging thinking 
Um, but I have to underline that uh, it's early days. Uh, it's very difficult to make very sort of uh, firm predictions of, of how the world is going to look like because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things are still uncertain. And we can go straight to the, to the second slide. There we go. Thank you. So, um, um, no need to go into details of uh, how dramatic uh, the impact has been and, and continues to be, um, including in Africa. Um, but just to underline that it really is a, a very comprehensive development crisis. Uh, it's a health crisis, but the impact on economic or the social and, and economic consequences um, uh, are uh, are dramatic, um, and also the underlying challenges, including the environmental crises, have not gone away. Um, and um, um, it's been said so far that in general in Africa, the impact of the COVID-19 uh, crisis have been mostly socioeconomic uh, and less health related, but this might also change as the pandemic evolves and the virus mutates. So um, I don't think we should um, you, we should have two firm conclusions on this yet. Um, but we do know that the long lasting effects uh, on the pop that there are long lasting effects on the population and development. Um, and, um, and this crisis will remain with us um, for, for some time to come. I guess um, my message on, um, on it is that um, this is not the time to shift focus radically uh, for, the, um, for the development partners. So the, the important long-term goals um, remain. Um, and, um, and of course, we know that the setbacks uh, are dramatic uh, in many ways, and we need to be very sensitive to partner countries' priorities and the needs um, of communities and, and populations. And particularly uh, any crisis and also this crisis is, is hard on people in vulnerable situations, such as women and girls, persons with disabilities. And, and we do need to continue uh, focusing um, on these populations. Next slide, please. So, um, some of the, the, the lessons that we are learning uh, in this situation, um, and, and I have to say, when I was preparing for this, um, this event, I, I realized that most of the lessons that I, I think we're learning are not new lessons. These Many of the things that I'm talking about are things we already knew um, and, and are learning again and are sort of continuing to think that these are, are very important for development partners to, to bear in mind. So one of them is, um, is that um, we need to be agile and prepared um, to, um, to um, adjust our activities so that we can uh, ensure our continuity in very rapidly evolving situations. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, shaken up uh, working practices, partnerships, business models, put unprecedented strain on public finances. And against this backdrop, um, development cooperation agencies have shown uh, impressive agility in responding to the health and humanitarian aspects, aspects of the pandemic while also ensuring uh, program continuity. Uh, for example, in our case, a lot of practical issues have been there to resolve, um, starting from um, allowing flexibility for reporting timelines or uh, spending timelines, various requirements, um, so that we have um, helped our um, partners um, to continue activities that were continued to be relevant um, uh, and that we didn't, for example, you know, um, so projects have a lot of uh, people employed. We did not want to be in a situation where there's a sudden halt of activities that did not need to be stopped. According to OECD DAC, um, the international development response to COVID-19 has been most effective where it built on existing good practice, local knowledge and leadership, and where flexibility to adapt to changing circumstances was already built into systems and partnerships. 
Um, and many developing development agencies have leveraged existing networks and domestic and partner country structures to coordinate their efforts in COVID-19 response. Of course, uh, it had, has to be admitted that coordinating uh, that a, a, a coordinated, joint up, coherent, transparent international response is difficult. It's always difficult, and it, it's difficult in these kinds of circumstances, um, even more so. Um, the role of local actors, particularly civil society contribution to sustainable development, has been reinforced uh, during the COVID pandemic. And, um, and it seems that development agencies are placing um, more trust on them, um, have engaged politically in support uh, of their work. Um, however, many um, local organizations um, um, struggle to access sufficient development finance and, and um, room for man to maneuver. Um, so I do think that this is a promising trend, um, something that, that will hopefully live on. Um, but there are lots of questions um, emerging from, for example, challenges of, of monitoring um, as the situation uh, drags on um, and new methodologies and, and partnerships um, need to emerge. Next. Um, but while, of course, continuing continuation has been important, so has been the ability to adapt, adjust and, and respond to, um, to the new situation. Um, the pandem pandemic has demonstrated even more clearly than before the importance of being able to adapt to changing contexts, not only the pandemic, but also the ever more frequent natu natu natural disasters, conflicts and other external risks call um, for greater coordination, flexibility and capacity uh, to adapt our support to the changing needs of, uh, of our partner countries and, and communities. Um, the OECD DAC says that COVID-19 pandemic and its secondary effects have revealed the importance um, but, and the challenge of applying lessons, evidence and evaluations during crisis. This is really hard to do, um, but ever more important. Uh, development agencies should be better prepared to conduct rapid learning to assess uh, and share evidence to guide decision making, to support uh, internal uh, and cross-country learning, and to stay focused on development results for accountability and communication. Um, what has happened to a rather large degree um, is redirection of activities and funding um, within programs, uh, within um, um, uh, but also then from, um, from activities to other activities. Um, it seems that donors have displayed quite a lot of cre creativity in reallocating budgeted funds and raising new resources as well. Um, and uh, humanitarian needs have uh, rapidly increased with multiple crises simultaneously. Um, and the, the needs have been um, really through the roof um, and some um, additional resources have been mobilized um, for that. Um, an interesting case of uh, cooperation and coordination um, is what we call the Team Europe effort, where um, the European Commission uh, or the European um, institutions, I should say, uh, together with member states um, have really made an effort to to um, allocate uh, resources to um, the pandemic and its impact, uh, and also to work uh, better together. Um, the EU has really responded shiftly, swiftly in the, the past few months um, and has wanted to show its, its solidarity. Um, the EU, uh, as the biggest global donor, also, of course, needed to do this. Um, then um, it it's clear that um, the, this kind of a, um, an intensified uh, coordination, um, it was an opportunity that the, the pandemic provided and, um, and it's been very interesting to be part of that. Um, initially, it started out as a, a sort of a COVID-19 response, but now we're looking at it much more long term. Uh, for the EU and member states to improve our, our collective development impact and, and offering. Um, and right now the Team Europe uh, is, is translated into concrete actions to support our joint vision for recovery that is sustainable, human rights-based, green, 
and strength, uh, strengthens gender equality uh, and boosts human development, especially for those furthest behind. Um, and Finland has been participating in, in this, these efforts um, and we feel that a unified approach means more results and impact uh, and we can join resources from member states, the EU budget and, and European financial institutions and to continue to look for more innovative ways to, to coordinate. Um, of course, uh, at the same time, underlining, uh, underlining that, um, that all of this should be uh, inclusive and, and ownership has to remain with our partner countries. Um, but just that we, we're working better together to make sure that, that we are as good uh, a partner as we can be. Um, there's been a lot of um, coordination happening around the debt issues, and this will continue, I think, for some time to come, um, knowing how central the debt question is. Uh, the debt moratorium um, initiative that is there right now um, it has been one way of easing the economic burden of the pandemic on, on uh, developing countries. Um, of course, it has to be said that compared to uh, previous de debt crises, the situation uh, is rather different now because of the, the nature of the debt um, at the moment. So uh, innovative solutions are going to be needed going forward. And, and it has to be uh, a responsibility that is shared by, by all debtors. <clears throat> vaccinations, a lot of discussion, of course, internationally on, on vaccinations as well. Um, and, and we do think that the global community will need to ensure that vaccines are made available to everyone. Um, no one is safe until we all are safe. Um, the, um, the, the, the major effort that has gone into this is around what we call the uh, ACT accelerator, access to COVID-19 tools, which has been there um, for it is, is there to accelerate development, production and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatments and vaccines. And that has brought together government scientists, businesses, uh, civil society and philanthropists, philanthropists and global health organizations. And within that, um, um, the so-called COVAX uh, initiative um, where um, the vaccination um, work has been going on um, and um, there is a financing uh, um, instrument within that where 92 low and middle income country, uh, countries will be uh, able to access um, uh, donor funded doses of safe and effective vaccines. Um, and um, the EU has been a major uh, funder of this. Um, it's not yet um, able to provide vaccinations. We all know that, um, that the the um, availability of vaccinations has been somewhat disappointing so far, but um, but this will uh, later in the year um, be a, an important contribution. And the EU is also working on um, methods to share um, vaccines from um, from our own um, uh, vaccination pools um, as as soon as they become uh, available. Um, then. Um, I wanted to just next slide show very quickly as a picture um, what Finland has been doing. Um, it's just a, a case of how uh, how it looks like in practice. Um, last year, this is what we were able to reallocate um, and uh, show some additional or uh, provide some additional resources to the COVID response. We've reallocated uh, approximately 10% of our um, existing development budget and then added some more, um, mainly humanitarian um, and then um, various other um, multilateral um, funding. I really want to underline here uh, the significance of working multilaterally. Um, Finland is one of the countries that um, provides a significant share of uh, unearmarked funding to both humanitarian <clears throat> and um, um, other multilateral organizations, and therefore uh, they've been able to react quickly, and, and this is really important for flexibility. Then let's go forward. Sorry, you're muted. Sorry, I muted myself by accident. <laughs> yes. So um, 
looking uh, looking forward then um of course maintaining global cooperation uh, is really really important um and focusing on sustainable development priorities the BB, bbbg the building back better and greener slogan um is popular now and and uh, and of course it does describe um a vision forward um on the other hand it is very much the same vision that we've had before um it's really sustainable development combining the various areas of sustainability together um for example, Finland has been going through a country programming process uh, at the same time as the pandemic has been going on. And uh, we do think that um, the deepening work um, on uh, areas that we've been uh, working with our partners before is really the way forward, uh, focusing on service delivery. Um, uh, and uh, the most important change really for us seems to be uh, a greater emphasis on flexibility, adaptive management, um, and um, uh, and uh, re uh, building resilience um, in uh, our partner countries and communities. Um, the big question is then, um, how will development finance develop going forward? Um, at the same time as the needs in developing countries are, are, are uh, increasing, so is also uh, the crunch on uh, economic and fiscal, uh, the economic and fiscal challenges in donor countries. Um, so far, we haven't seen any major impacts on ODA, um, apart from um, the uh, reduction uh, declared or, or announced by United Kingdom. Um, but we will only see going forward um, whether there'll be an impact um, and, and how big that might be. Um, the uh, DAC members have declared their ambition last year to strive to protect ODA budgets during the crisis. But of course, the reality uh, will only be seen in a couple of years' time. But of course, uh, again, this underlines um, that uh, public funding will never be able to solve um, development um, on its own. Um, but we do need to continue working hard on, on leveraging other resources, uh, private investments, um, and innovating on, on how best to, to leverage and catalyze uh, resources. So um, I'll end here. Um, I don't think that I, I'm able to paint a very new normal picture. I think I'm uh, more relying on um, that actually what we know about good development seems to be valid also in the new situation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, let us turn now to our next speaker, Dr. Desiree Venkate Shalom. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? I can, yes, good morning. Good, and let me start by apologizing for being a bit late. We have regular power cuts in my neighborhood in Abidjan, and uh, those of you who know the continent, unfortunately, this is a, one of, of the issues we, we need to tackle. So I'm working out of my phone as a router, but by the positive, in Africa, the 4G revolution and uh, my good friend Njuguna, who I've not seen in a long time, his country, his home country is, a, is really a trendsetter in that space. So it's good to be with you and happy to, to see Satu also. And thanks for having me uh, for this fantastic uh, exchange. I, I will not use any slide because you know I, I want to share my view and I also want to say I'm speaking in my private capacity uh, and the views I express should not be attributed in one way or another to the African Development Bank group. Just need to say that at the beginning. So I've, I've been asked to speak on the resource mobilization side for the continent. And, and I'll speak a little bit more on the operational side. Uh, given this is my, my area of work and my experience, and I think uh, I can bring more value to the exchange on that. I, I listened in yesterday also, there were my good friend uh, Steve Karanjikizi from uh, ECA, Mario Pezzini from OECD. So, and what Satu has said, I think uh, the, the, the roots of the problem, we know them very well. So, uh, you know, when you look at resource mobilization, you can see it in a post-COVID world or in a during-COVID world, 
You can see it in two ways, as completely negative or remain optimist. I remain very optimist and I'll tell you why. The latest news on resources for the continent is actually quite intriguing and very surprisingly positive in, for some countries. And Njugu now will share his own experience and maybe disagree with me on that. Uh, for Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, at the beginning of the year, you may be, I've seen it in, in the news, Cote d'Ivoire issued a 850 million euro bond, 850 million euro bond, that's close to $1 billion, vastly oversubscribed for a country like Cote d'Ivoire, vastly oversubscribed at a yield of 4.3%. 4.3% and 250 million euro was for a maturity of 27 years. So Njugu now, when you were governor, I mean, you did a fantastic job uh, on, on domestic capital market. We welcome your views on how we can leverage domestic capital market same thing happened for Benin more recently, a couple of weeks ago. Benin went on the capital market, raised half a billion euro at a, a little bit higher yield of 6%. So one message is, as we know, there's vast liquidity in the market. There's ample liquidity in the market. The issue is the risk and how you tap into it. So how do you structure uh, the transaction? How do you work together to ensure that African countries have long-term patient capital to fund their national development plan? So I'll come back to this a little bit later, but you know, not, I mean, sometimes you listen to the news. Sometimes I just turn off the TV because if you watch on the news, you get the feeling that you know, things are bad. I'm not saying things are not bad, you know. I'll give the numbers later. But there are glimpses of very positive uh, financing coming to parts of the continent. And Benin and Cote d'Ivoire are just two examples I've given. There are, I'll come back to things which may be a little bit more worrisome uh, later for, for, uh, uh, for financing uh, the development. Now, I think also just to, to speak on what Satu said about development partners working together. I've been in this business for 15, 16 years now. And I can tell you, this is the first time ever on the operational side, I've seen development partners come so quickly, quickly and at scale, not enough, nothing. I mean, I think Satu, I agree with you. Nothing will be, I mean, it's especially for the continent, we don't have deep pockets as, as you know, European countries, as the US, as Japan, we are in a different ball game. But still, you know, at the African Development Bank Group, in a couple of months, we came up with a COVID response facility, $10 billion. That's, that's not small amount. Now that 10 billion, you can think it's big, but it's still not enough and it's much smaller than my colleagues at the World Bank Group have been able to put on the table. It's a multiple of that, multiple of that. We work closely together and the World Bank Group has been able also to, to put a lot of resources. Satu spoke about the EC. So second message in the short run. So the, the, the first message is on financing our long-term national development plan. We need to stay the course. We need to leverage all possibilities, including capital markets, including domestic capital markets, all of this. So that's one. Second message on short-term liquidity problem. I think we've done quite okay and national governments have actually been leading uh, from their own balance sheet, but the international community has, uh, has taken a role, an important role. So the issue now, it's not only liquidity, it's solvency. 
And this is where uh, Satu uh, on the DSSI have uh, been party to the G20 conversation. That is one of the big topic which we need to address because so many of our countries have a debt sustainability issue now. I mean, out of the 37 poorest countries on the continent, the low income African countries, slightly more than half of them are either at high risk of debt distress or in debt distress. So we need to create, we need to address the solvency issue and it has to be addressed urgently. The DSSI is a fantastic G20 initiative that we need to upload. We need to keep that and push it. But I think now we need to set our side, sights on addressing the solvency issue. And you know, there are fundamental debt issues which have to be resolved on both sides, on both sides, both the debtors and the lenders, you know. But that conversation must happen. Otherwise, the national development plans and the resources for countries uh, will not be there. The, the, I mean, if you look at what happened during HIPIC MDRI, fiscal space was created and countries use that fiscal space to improve on their public finance management, on their social spending, a lot of good things were done. So we need to have a conversation on the solvency issue to assure that resources flow uh, to, to those countries. Now, on, uh, so that's on the immediate aspect for uh, resources in, as, as COVID is. And, and on the uh, long-term uh, long term one, uh, we need to keep our eye on the ball and address and find ways to mobilize, as I say, patient long-term capital to address the fundamental bottlenecks, which are infrastructure. These problems will not go away. You know, if you look at energy, if you look at water, water and sanitation, these are problems which needs to be addressed. You know, that's, has to be addressed. So on the one hand, we need to address the short-term issue, immediate issue, which is being addressed. And then in the long term, we need to build on the capacity that many African countries have, 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 have now. You know, they've cleaned their books, some of them have quite good public finance management put in place. If you look at a country like Rwanda, for instance, you know, if you roll the clock 20 years ago, no one would have expected such a, a, a good uh, economic performance for a country like Rwanda. There are countries which still need to improve, but we need to recognize that not, I mean, the fundamentals on public finance management and domestic resource mobilization has improved in many countries. So, so just the high level messages I want to convey uh, because we are not in a physical uh, space where we can, you know, so just to, to, to put that forward. One, uh, there, there are opportunities right now and we need, we need to recognize that, but we need to recognize that there are many countries, in particular, the most fragile countries. And within that group, one area where we need to, to keep in mind is the, is the Sahel countries. I mean, Finland works very, very closely with us, and I want to thank Finland. Finland has been innovative and provided us a concessional donor loan at the bank, one of the very few countries providing such assistance. So I want through you, Satu, to thank, thank Finland. But, but there are countries, there's a group of countries in Africa, but whatever we say, require sustained and high level of grant money. We cannot run away from that. 
And Satu, I heard you say rightly that the commitments on ODA are there, but there are also indications that in the short run, that is being, you know, sort of uh, not so, 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 so sure. If you look at our number one contributor to the concessional fund in the African Development Fund is the UK. The UK is one of a few country with, uh, uh, with no league countries, which has a 0.7 GNI for ODA commitment captured in law, but they had to revise it down to 0.5. So my message is on grant money, on concessional resources, we need to be there. The second one is address the solvency issue. And this one, it has to come from the G7, G20, with a strong voice from African countries and also actions taken by African countries. And then for the long term, my view is there's a need for front loading of, of, uh, of assistance urgently. You know, the needs are so big that we can't stay at such a, at a low level. We floated uh, an idea uh, two years ago with, uh, uh, actually it was Minister Ngozi, who is now going to be you know, in a new capacity of, of front loading future flows of ODA, issuing what we call a big bond and getting those resources urgently on board. So the last message is really think differently and innovate to get in those funds. So I've not used my presentation. Uh, I just thought I'll share my views on an operational side, and I hope that was useful and I'm happy to engage with you further. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you very much. I think we now turn to our, our third speaker, Professor Juguna Ndungu. Uh, the Zoom podium is yours. Can I move on? Okay, let me go to the first screen. Then it's five areas of coverage. I wanted actually to look at the impact of COVID pandemic and what has happened from fiscal space to poverty, to household poverty, to inequality. And I think some of this has been mentioned. But then I also say that the digital evolution was given some space. And this is helping because of the electronic payments platform. And I'm going to show that in some countries in Africa, they even design targeted social protection programs. But of course, there are more benefits when it comes to electronic payment system, rich electronic payment system, that makes sure that everybody in the economy is included. That is very inclusive. And the third point I want to talk about is the post-COVID economic recovery strategy. It is now required, but where do we start? And the fourth point is, perhaps we may want to ask ourselves, what is going to be the best, or what is going to define Africa's development path? We know we have failed in all the, in some of the uh, 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 approaches that we've taken in the past. And there are reasons why they have failed, but we need to come and revisit that. And then ask the question, will the fourth industrial revolution be the answer? And finally, I have some thoughts about why economists in Africa have not structurally adjusted. The economic transformation has been slow, but what we do we need to focus on? And for me, that is very, very important. And that is likely to be the one that uh, will help me in terms of talking about the future activities. Let me go to the next slide. Thank you. This one was just to talk about what is happening to the debt. The debt situation is worsening, has worsened. And you can look at the countries in distress and look at countries who, which had low risk, they are diminishing. And in the, uh, the second top, you look at countries in, in uh, uh, sorry, in the countries in distress and high debt, you can see they have been increasing. So we can actually show that the COVID-19 has exacerbated the condition. The next slide, the question is, why is that in Africa? Uh, the next slide, uh, why is that? It's because Africa started from a very weak point and now the recession is biting. The fiscal space was already diminished and then debt crisis was looming. But my biggest point is at that point that debt accumulation in Africa was not actually accompanied with capital accumulation that would support the economies in Africa in terms of future capacity for growth. And this is where we are getting beaten by the rain. So we are asking, why are we here? But look at it there's, this way that there are several factors that explain that point. Why did debt accumulation not reflect in capital accumulation 
to support the future capacity, the, the capacity for future growth in African economy. This is where we have to reverse things. And this is where emerging opportunities tells us that is where we go to reverse the issues. The next slide, please. And then the impact of the pandemic on household poverty. We have had studies on recent data using even phone surveys. I think we have been happy with Kipra in Kenya and Uganda, Senegal and Ethiopia and Ghana. They provided some of this data and we have done some uh, analysis. But one of the startling conclusion is that the efforts of reversing poverty and inequality and house, household poverty and inequality in African countries for the last 20 years seems to be reversing. It is actually a very startling conclusion. Ethiopia, for example, where poverty has with the, within the COVID time has increased by 4%. Look at Ghana in 14%. Look at Kenya in, with 13%. Senegal with 32%, that 3%, and Uganda with about 8%. So you can see that the poverty, if you compare poverty in the COVID days and look at household poverty, especially house, uh, female-headed households and urban poor, the, we have sort of reversed the gains that we have really had managed for the last 20 years in terms of poverty eradication. And so it means that the first point in terms of uh, the uh, opportunities coming up is to say the impact of the pandemic on household poverty, we now have to say, how do we reverse this? Let me go to the, 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 the next slide. Now, the second point I had mentioned is that digital evolution, the electronic payments platform, and this is what the CDF the, the, the mentioned. I fought very hard when I was governor of Central Bank of Kenya to introduce mobile phone based financial uh, services. But actually what nobody saw and even the big banks didn't see is that we were actually fighting for a retail electronic payments platform. Retail because it can bring everyone from whichever corner of the market using the mobile phone. And so it means that the digital systems came in handy when the pandemic rose and governments encouraged uh, retail electronic payments platforms and discouraged cash. And for me, I'm happy that even Kenya designed very quickly social protection programs and in the urban areas to protect some of the urban families. And this is a major benefit because essentially we are like getting an opportunity to accept that the retail electronic payments platform can evolve, which is effective, it is efficient, it is transparent and safe. And so it is also an initial entry to financial services. And so it means in Africa, because we are plagued by informal markets, it could be an indirect way of formalizing informal markets. But more importantly for me is that the evolution of e-government services, tax policy designs, tax payments platforms, and even revenue administration to minimize leakages has become very, very critical. And I think this ties up with what the city was talking about, domestic resource mobilization. We can design optimal tax instruments with very optimal tax payments platforms because the whole idea of taking a trip to pay taxes or going to your bank to pay taxes is, is really not working. So, but the whole picture in terms of the emerging opportunities is that once you have a successful electronic payments platform, then it means that um, you can actually, uh, or you can perhaps it can become a game changer. And we know that FinTechs can actually roll out products to affect the whole, the whole sectors of the economy. This is frictionless development. It is already invested in. And so it's a question, it's a question of rolling out new product. Let me go to the next slide, please. Yeah, the post COVID economic recovery is required. We need an economic recovery strategy. But let me state that if you look at the history of Africa and most of the developing countries, it takes a crisis to push for implementation of reforms. And that's why, remember Kofi Annan said that to please make sure that you do not take, a, you have to take advantage of any crisis that comes because you can push for that. But I'm not telling you to go looking for a crisis so that we can push reforms. It is the other way around, taking advantage of the, of the crisis so that we push reforms. Where are the critical areas of reforms? One is the fiscal side. The other one is the debt side for capital accumulation that gives economies uh, capacity for future growth. I wouldn't want to go into the details why this has happened, but it is very, very important that we can see what lessons we have learned. We were dealing with a lot of work in healthcare financing and healthcare uh, infrastructure, and we can see where the rain beat us. Then continental free trade area is an area that everybody is talking about. 
But I have argued in the G20 meeting and T20 meetings that if we don't reform the global value chain, then continental free trade area is not going to give us a lot of benefits. The more critical uh, issues are institutional reforms. Institutions will be important in shaping economic behavior. And this is more fundamental than even factor endowments because markets and coordination failures are coming in just because of the institutions, the capacity and capability in institutions. And this will go hand in hand in terms of improving government, uh, government the role of government to, to facilitate and overcome coordination failures. And that for me is very, very important because coordination failures are, is the one that has led to market failure. In fact, what Desiree was saying that you have bonds that are being oversubscribed is because one, if you look at the new sector, there are no opportunities for investment. And if you did, the risk profile is not yet known first because of the pandemic. And the other one is actually government and institutional structure. We refuse always to talk about the government and institutional structure, which is the one providing us with a massive risk profile that we cannot overcome. You can deal with market, with, with, with market risks, but you cannot deal with the institutional and uh, government failure of government policies risks because they are quite as amounting for an enemy. Let me go to the, the, the next slide. Uh, the next slide is talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And this is where, of course, I've mentioned about the digital uh, evolution taking shape. And I do know that we can talk about this until cows come home because it is exciting, it's a new idea. It's a question of whether we are going to get people to actually follow up in terms of what is happening. And we have seen everybody is now adapting digital services, digital financial services. We have seen even modernizing sectors like agriculture. And for us, this is a, a very important uh, de development. So essentially, I'm not going into details. Maybe let's go to the, final, to the next uh, slide because I'm just giving examples of what the fourth industrial evolution can move. We have seen improvement in healthcare and even human capital. And uh, we have seen artificial intelligence coming in, telehealth, and these are very, very important because they are defining how the fourth industrial uh, revolution, if well defined, can be can harness and even create a development path for Africa. The next slide. Uh, the next one, this is a good marketing uh, tool for, uh, if you look at the Brookings and what we uh, pre presented last year in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, we have so many examples. Digital education, and this I can talk about because AERC has uh, training programs across public universities in Africa. And all of a sudden we could not bring students together to travel. And so we mounted uh, digital, uh, the, the, the virtual programs at the graduate level, at masters and PhD across African universities. It is also it means that we can actually uh, digitize, but now the new English is digital, di digitalization of education. And we have seen virtual learnings and they are working even when students were in, uh, pupils were, in, were at home. And we have seen even e-conferencing is working a, a lot. So it is the fourth industrial revolution may help us in terms of skip some of the uh, implement, implementation strategies that actually inhibit our, um, our move. Then we can always debate about the aspects of for the industrial revolution and what can, can be adapted. But it has become quite is, easy to adapt. The whole thing is now, can we make it a national policy? Let me go to the, four, the final slide. I think maybe that is going to be the final slide there. Yeah? Okay, number five. Now, having seen the industrial revolution, that what it, the, the, the fourth industrial revolution and how it can support African economies to leap from their development strategy. The next question is to say, how can we achieve structural economic transformation in African economies, which is more urgent now? I have a few points to make. I have started talking about em emphasizing the role of institutions in shaping economic behavior, which is more fundamental than factor endowment. And here I can talk about even my role as governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. We pushed for reforms in the payment system, and that's how we, we have digital financial system. We pushed for new monetary policy framework that is consistent and allows us to look at the, 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 the avenues that we look at. I pushed for domestic resource mobilization using an infrastructure board to create capital, to create, to provide government with funds for public investments and to cross the infrastructure gap. It means that once you have a dedicated institutional maker, they can push for these reforms. 
The failure of import substitution, for example, if you want to see in, in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, for example, was due to lack of capital accumulation to upgrade industries and was based or was tried to be applied by countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that were also capital scarce. It could not work. The poverty trap we see in most African countries is sustained by the inability to implement dynamic structural transformation because capital accumulation is inadequate to cross, to cross the thresholds required for this structural transformation. We can address this with a lot of ease. We don't need any new ideas. It's only a question of focusing on how the institutions should read this. When opportunities, when opportunities arise to raise the level of capital accumulation via, for example, debt financed public infrastructure that I've talked about, governance issues step up and they destroy the process through so many aspects, mismatch in terms of the investment, as well as the cost of the delivery of those projects. And this is an, in addition to poor government facilitation to overcome co coordination failures. And we have seen that coordination failures actually lead to policy failures and even market failures. And this is very, very important. We need to look at how does physical infrastructure and core infrastructure are coordinated so that they support the private sector. And finally, the decade, the 2000 decade witnessed a lot of uh, formation of long-term visions. I was part of Kenya in terms of vision 2030. Rwanda has vision 2025, just to mention a few. For us, what did it provide? It provided us with a promise or a commitment or a technology commitment for long-term periods of policy clarity and coordination. Perhaps while we want to show case or to, to put a strong case in terms of structural economic transformation, we need to take a critical assessment in terms of what is happening. The last slide is the one that we use mostly to say, uh, where is it? Do I have the last slide? Yeah. The last slide. Okay. The last slide. Um, it's what we say. We used to actually thank everyone for doing that. <laughs> I okay. wanted to use it to say so highly because Wongozi is part of this. Asante sana. Taksumike. <laughs> Thank you very much and for listening to me. And this is, uh, these are my thoughts in terms of what are the opportunities. Thank you very much. I hope I've not taken too much time. And I know I also have a constraint in terms of my next meeting at uh, 12. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a lot of food for thought here and I think some really interesting connections across, across the three remarks. Um, I wanted to just uh, to kick off discussion to pick up on on one of the the points that that Desiree highlighted in in his remarks about the solvency issue, which I think connects with with what others have been talking some of the issues that that all of you have been talking about as well. So you know he makes the point that the issue now is not only liquidity, it's solvency, and many countries, of course, are in debt distress, and we need to address the solve solvency issue urgently. I wonder what uh, what Satu and Juguna think about uh, this point, and what are the prospects for addressing it? Please, either either of you, um, what are your thoughts? Um, Guna, would you like to start since you were in a rush? Uh, okay, <laughs> actually, yeah. Well, there, there are two sides to the story in terms of solvency, and, and I do agree. And one of them is that uh, we have created a market structure for even selling de debt instruments. And even the private sector is also selling those debt instruments. But what is going to sustain us, to sustain the process, is what we see first in terms of the real sector of the economy. What are these funds supposed to do? You know, who is absorbing these funds? So it becomes sustainable. And that's, I go back to my point that if they are going to be used to create uh, or to accumulate capital, uh, so that they allows for the real economy to have the capacity for future growth, then that is a sustainable process. But then if it is just a package, a packing for excess liquidity, just like the slave mentioned about excess liquidity, if it's just to pack the excess liquidity for a short-term return, then what we are really doing is that we are, pushing the market to continue working with this within this waiting option. So we need a mechanism to dislodge the market from this waiting option. And that's why I went back and said, we have to have a new uh, 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 growth path or a new growth model for African economies. So that at least we, we move from there, provide certainty and also dislodge the market from this waiting option. Because if you don't do that, by the way, 
uh, they say saying it's a short term, it's a, it's a commercial paper, but we continue because there is excessive, excess liquidity, we are going to continue issuing commercial paper because the market wants to trade in it. But that's all, that's all what will happen. And uh, I don't know whether the CDM may have uh, different ideas, but my, my strong belief is that a vibrant economy will give us opportunities for investment. And that is very, very important that you can channel this excess liquidity to investable uh, platforms and even to, to, to new investments. And they are going to be very, very important. They can be harnessed by governments to provide uh, or to close the gap of uh, the infrastructure gap. Uh, the CDM complained that it, could, it was a power outage and uh, so it means that is that that is a constraint, which actually he's, it is good for him. He can use the phone, but if you are in a factory, you are trying to produce to confirm uh, export items, you cannot do that. So you can see the constraints are drying us. Is the one that is really hitting at the private sector, and it acquires this waiting option, making an assumption that things will come back. That's why I come back to saying we need to have the more a model. We take advantage of the crisis to develop a model for future economic transformation of African economies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe just a very brief comment on my side. Um, I do agree that it is um, that it is um, a matter to be resolved. Um, on the other hand, I think um, where we are coming from in a lot of economies, the the, the background or the the structure of um, or the patterns of debt uh, are different from what they were when we were um, doing HIPIC and, um, and MDRI. Um, and the partners who need to be around the table to solve this are also different. And, and how do we engage um, commercial uh, financiers, uh, non-Paris club debtors, I think is, is critical. And, and I think um, we cannot be in a situation where we sort of, uh, um, you know, um, let partners that are, are part of um, the uh, the uh, issues that have emerged um, sort of off the hook and resolve this with um, with for example multilateral uh, financing um, at this moment. So I think uh, it's it's a more difficult discussion to be had, um, and I I fully agree that we cannot just do a, a short term solution that does not address the the underlying long term um, issues. Thanks. Thanks. Before I give uh, Desiree a chance to come back in, let's, um, I think, Chaguna, we have you for two more minutes. So if you would like to offer some closing reflections, uh, please do so. I, I realize in Helsinki, we have you for another hour, but <laughs> in Nairobi, I think your time is up. So please, close Yeah, in. thank you very much. But I had programmed with the time in, uh, Addis ah, sorry, there is around because of Wongo's Institute. So I was yeah. like in tone. But <laughs> you, you, I think I, I do agree with that, Satu. You know, the current debt uh, structure is difficult because it is composed of non-Paris members and some of it is also private sector coordinating a, a mechanism to actually resolve the debt crisis would be a major problem. But I think in the short term, what has been uh, proposed is that, what is the most urgent now because we need to manage the COVID? It's actually to look at the fiscal space and how we can improve on the fiscal space. And one of them was to suspend debt, service, uh, debt servicing and even have an agreement because then we can actually move to a restructuring in, in the medium term. But in the short term, that was, how do we improve the fiscal space? And that for me is very, very critical right now. But the other one is that once you get into that, those small steps, they may help us in terms of seeing how do we manage the future debt in terms of uh, repayment period and uh, the, the return on uh, those investments and then the, the mismatch they create with foreign exchange market. And we have not even seen reverberations, for example, in the other uh, markets, for example, the foreign exchange market, we have not seen inflation. It's because everybody is con constrained by what you really need to do to work on this. So I do agree with you with the current debt problem. But I've argued and I've studied that uh, uh, we are looking for how we are going to move into it, that in the long term, Africa needs to move back and look at domestic resource mobilization. First of all, on one side is the debt instrument, sorry, the tax instrument. We, we need to have tax, tax instruments that provide you with optimal resources, but does not also uh, create um, a, a, a problem of, uh, 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 or uh, does not affect the relative price structure in a way that it is disastrous. 
I have always given an example in Kenya for beer taxation. And beer taxation is excisable tax. We do know it is for reasons, but the technology has overtaken us. So you really have to come up and say, what is the optimal level of taxing alcohol, not beer? Can you tax alcohol? I was living in Sweden, so I can always give those examples. Can you tax <laughs> alcohol on the basis of its content? Then it means that it is going to serve two purposes. One is a sin tax because as you continue doing that, it's good, bad for health and we can subsidize the health sector using that. But secondly, you're not going to find people upgrading or down and downgrading consumption because you taxed beer, wine, whiskey, whatever in different levels. That's what Kenya government is. So if you look at Kenya government the last 50 years, it has been getting less and less revenue from those. Yet we have provided examples and that was a paper in 2001. So that's one example. We can actually come to optimal instruments of taxation that the Ministry of Finance and the, and the revenue authorities agree, and then they together move with that. So it is not just the debt, the, the domestic resource mobilization instruments, but it's also the, the quality of that. The, then the second, and, the, and the second aspect of that is even uh, digital, uh, the digital platforms to manage um, revenue administration because the leakages in, in our countries is what, actually what it means. It's not the amount of tax revenue we have, it's the amount of leakage the revenue has. But, but that is a good uh, avenue of trying to improve the, the whole issue of domestic resource mobilization. Thank you very much. Um, so to our audience, I see there's a, there are a couple of questions here and I'm gonna give you an opportunity in the moment to ask your questions live. Uh, so be ready. I think Funmi has, uh, Sotan has the first question. But let's allow uh, Desiree to respond if he'd like. And I think we say goodbye to Juguna who has to leave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We yeah, Desiree, have yeah, Desiree you can say, well, I'll wait for Desiree to respond. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'll be very short. So I, I agree fully with what has been said, both on the non-OECD DAC uh, countries and on DRM by and Juguna. So uh, just two points. The responsibility to securitize the flows for long-term investment and proper use to generate adequate returns rest with the borrower and the sovereigns who are signing the contract. So upstream, a lot of work has to be done to ensure African countries, governments are getting a good deal. So, we, there's one institution which is not part of the bank group, African Development Bank, but which is a sister institution we have called the African Legal Support Facility. Maybe Andrew Buna knows the ALSF. For me, that's a fantastic type of institution which comes in and advises countries upstream and also downstream when we run in trouble on how to make sure they are getting a good deal and when they negotiate now on solvency issue, because vis-a-vis -vis commercial creditors, the issue would be reputation, ratings vis-a-vis -vis rating agencies, and haircuts. You know, there needs to be a conversation involving the commercial creditors, the MDBs, the bilaterals, and the borrowers properly advised. Otherwise, you know it can have very adverse uh, uh, issue. On the non-OECD DAC, Satu, I cannot agree more. The, the, the balance sheet of borrowers is not the balance sheet we had at the time of EPIC MDRI. I think we would be fooling ourselves by saying this is a Paris Club only conversation. This is a broader conversation. There are, you know, uh, communicating channels. And the conversation is actually very good from what I've seen with both Paris Club and non-Paris Club members, that willingness is there. So we need to, to really at the highest level at the G20, uh, all MDBs, bilateral, stable course, partnership, I think you said it, Satu, partner, be aware of the differences, but we need to get OECD DAC, non-OECD DAC 
both of us to agree. Otherwise, it won't be enough. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we have a question in the audience from Funmi Sotan. Are you there? Can you ask your question briefly? Otherwise, I will ask it for you. I'm here. Yes. Thank you for the excellent presentations. Um, when we are talking about resource mobilization and also support by donors, we have to think about corruption, especially in African countries where there's very little citizen demand for accountability from leaders. So how do we handle this? Because it's a key constraint uh, in the debt problem. For instance, there are cases of um, COVID-19 support funds being mismanaged. Leaders claim or government officials claim that they have paid citizens and citizens say we have not been paid. So what strategies are available to address this uh, issue of corruption is a hydra headed problem that we have and affects the effective use of uh, funds, especially borrowed funds. Thank you. Thank you. Satu or Desiree, would you like to respond? Satu, you want to go first? Or come in? <laughs> Not particularly, but I will. <laughs> No, I think uh, I can say a few words and, and happy to, to have you continue, Desiree. Um, this is, of course, um, a difficult uh, question uh, or, or difficult to address effectively. Um, and it's not unique to the COVID situation. It's, uh, it's a longer term issue. Um, in terms of uh, donor funded activities, um, what we can do uh, as far as, as or, or can, can try and, and do as best as we can um, is to, to build oversight um, um, into those activities so that um, that mismanagement uh, is revealed. Um, but then it's a much broader question in particular for uh, when it relates to the debt issue that um, uh, it's not. It's it's building the the national uh, capacity um, to to address uh, and prevent uh, and reduce uh, corruption. Um, where um, I think um, a lot uh, can be a lot of improvements can be built on on systems. And and Gunnar spoke a lot about the, the possibilities that the digital world is providing us where there'll be uh, fewer possibilities of um, or fewer people actually handling resources um, where they will be directed directly um, uh, going through uh, digital channels or we can build uh, other um, systems that um, that uh, optimize or uh, reduce the risks. So there's that side. There's building institutions that has been mentioned uh, today by by several speakers. I, th or, uh, I think it's it's really it is of course key. Um, both um, government institutions, but then oversight institutions, um, parliaments, and so on. Um, and then helping build the uh, demand side um, with media, uh, civil society, and so on. Um, this is long-term work, and, and of course the responsibility really lies with uh, with the, the national governments um, in terms of, of na um, domestic resources, which are the main uh, funder of development after all. Um, but then donors can can support some of these trends and and. Um, Whenever we are involved with uh, direct financing, we have a bit uh, of a bigger role to play. But yeah, these are my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. So let's let's start by being very clear. Corruption is unacceptable and must not be tolerated. It is unacceptable. Uh, having said that. Uh, it happens. It happens not only in Africa, unfortunately. We have evidence of corruption around the world. Some of them are even more sophisticated than the most sophisticated we see on the continent. But it is unacceptable. 
to uh, uh, Hunmi, I, I agree with you in that it has to be owned and led by the citizens and the institutions of the countries first and foremost. I think Satu, I also agree with you. The outside world and other institutions can only help. But that, that call to those actually uh, misusing funds must be led by the own uh, institutions and citizens of the country. So that's, that's maybe generic, but concretely, what can we do? Uh, it's a long term. We are not going to fix it. I think we, we should not hide behind our small finger and say we are going to fix it overnight. It's long term, we need to be persistent and multiple actions. One, uh, for international organizations like ourselves, where I work and others have worked, immediate sanctions applied as per our rules and procedure in any misappropriation of funds, immediate. And these are heavy sanctions. I used to sit on the sanctions board of the African Development Bank Group. Uh, these are confidential uh, files I cannot divulge. But trust me, these are heavy, heavy penalties. OK, so that's one. We can set the example. We can set the tone at the international level, at MDB's level, by clearly taking action. Two, fool me. There are many things the, the public does not see, but we play an important role. It's our convening power our policy dialogue when we gain, bring people behind closed doors and we talk and we get them to do the right things. So again, I've been involved in those exchanges. They happen quite at a high level uh, and, and, and good results uh, are seen. Uh, institutions is the key. Uh, on the continent, there's a, quite a number of anti-corruption units which have been set in place. We need to appropriately fund them and ensure they are independent. So maybe there's a push at the international community for a program to actually fund those institutions, but without them being perceived as being external parties trying to interfere in internal affairs. We need to be very, uh, how, you, how you say that, uh, cognizant of those, of those perceptions. Perceptions matter a lot. And last but not least, leadership, leadership, leadership. Set the example at the top. Again, I come back to the example of Rwanda. Example at the top, and you see the results. Thank you. Thanks much. Um, so we're, we're almost out of time. I, uh, the, we, we never have enough time with these things. Uh, and there are still some questions here in the chat. There's a great question from um, Edward Gerald and Lanha about uh, adoption of blended financing. What's the best approach to ensure higher adoption of blended financing, which mix both private and, and public funding for Desiree? There's another question um, I have, I've been given on the table about the SDGs and um, uh, you know, Satu has a, had a great second slide showing the SDGs and the, the COVID um, virus spotting all over them. And I wonder where this leaves us for the SDGs. Uh, where, where do we think um, uh, the SDG agenda is going? Will there, there be need for adjustment and so on? We have just a few more minutes, um, perhaps keeping those questions in mind or, or other points you'd like to highlight. Maybe I'll give our speakers just a, a minute each to have some closing reflections. And then I'm under very strict instructions that I need to end on time. So please, maybe Satu a minute and then Desiree a minute. Thank you. Um, okay, I uh, already responded um, on, the, on the chat to the, the very concerning question of misuse of COVID uh, really funds. And, and uh, it's important that those be addressed to um, or through the institutions that are involved, and, and um, I'm, I'm quite worried about these reports. Um, just, but just on the uh, longer term question, I think this was a really, really interesting conversation. Um, 
and I think um, so I remain of the view that the you know sustainable development framework um, is relevant going forward um, and uh, I also agree um, with the assessment that that this crisis presents an opportunity to have um, a better or, or long-term vision for economic development, but then also it has to go with, um, with the um, uh, human and ecological side of things and, and having that balance uh, going forward. And I think um, also very uh, much agree with the, the ro role of technology um, and the digital uh, side of things and really taking those steps more rapidly than what we would have been able to do otherwise, I think is, a, is one of the big opportunities um, that we have at the moment. Um, so a lot of uh, concerns, but also I do think that, that there, is, uh, there are some silver linings that we should be building on. Thanks. Thank you. So thank, thank you everyone and thank you to the organizers, first of all, for inviting me to share my views and thank you to Satu and uh, to Andrew Buna and the participants. Unfortunately, we can't answer all the questions. Uh, people can get in touch uh, bilaterally uh, as need be. Uh, just on the blending uh, question, which is a great question, uh, you know, there's no silver bullet. We need all the instruments and blending is one of them. We however need to be careful when we talk of blending and using concessional resources going uh, as a financing item in a commercial plan, not to create distortions. Maybe what we advocate uh, also as we do blending and we do do blending is think of instruments like guarantees, partial risk guarantees, partial credit guarantees, invite you to visit the bank's website and you'll get uh, quite a lot of information or get in touch with me through the organizers. I'll be happy to, to, to answer the question. So last, last comment, let's keep our eye on the long-term development goal for the continent. Uh, financing gap is still in the vicinity of $120 billion for infrastructure. So that's big numbers. We'll be coming out with the African Economic Outlook very soon. So watch out for the African Development Bank Group African Economic Outlook in the coming weeks, and you'll get more on the same uh, topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Satu and Desiree. Um, so thank you to all three of our, our panelists, and thank you to the, you, the audience, for, for joining us in this session and posing such um, great questions, which are, are here in the chat. Um, so I think this is uh, the place we need to end, um, uh, just with the hope that we can build back better from this, this new normal. Uh, and um, we'll go now straight into our, our next session, I think, which is the, the closing session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, the Desire and uh, Satu and uh, in his absence, uh, Professor Njuguna. So now with uh, the next session is going to be quite brief so that we can bring this conference to a close. And I'll be giving the summary and vote of thanks. And once again, my name is Maureen Were, a UNUIDA Research Fellow and focal point for the UNUIDA project on sustainable solutions on development in Tanzania. So that is a project that we are implementing with a partner, our partners in Tanzania. And that's the project that I coordinate at UNWIDA. And um, we are now at, it's now 12.22 according to the East African time. And uh, I think we still have a few minutes so that we can bring the meeting to a close. So my task this morning is fairly difficult and easy, but also difficult in the sense that we've had, we have had for the last two days, very lively, fruitful, and insightful discussions from very eminent uh, presenters, starting with the, with the keynote address from Vera Songwe. And so we have had quite uh, a lot to discuss 
And as you can see, I only have like few minutes to summarize. So if you allow me, I'll just, I've, I've just like uh, put a few points that I'll, I'll try and as much as possible to see how I can capture the, the key points. We start, Dr. Vera Songwe, I apologize for the planes. I, I'm just next to the airport, so apologies for that. Can you hear me now? So, Dr. Vera Songwe started us off by providing a detailed discussion of the macroeconomic impact and challenges which laid the ground for the rest of the sessions in a very good way. And this was followed by presentations by eminent speakers and seasoned researchers that we've been listening to in the last two days, uh, just up to the last session that has just ended. Now to start us off, I've, I'll highlight some of the key points that, has, that emerged both from the keynote address and also from the presentations. Africa has three crises to deal with, health, economic, and climate change. And this was very well highlighted by Dr. Vera Songwe, who, who gave us our keynote address. He, she also noted that uh, 2020 was much better owing to the effective response undertaken across the African countries, and that we may have a bit of more challenges to deal with in 2021 going forward. As we all know, it's now one year since the, the pandemic came uh, uh, emerged. And since then, there are quite a number of uh, challenges that have been noted on various fronts. African countries have been directly affected and indirectly, directly and indirectly following a decline in global demand. As we know, all most of the advanced countries uh, and all the other countries are going through recession and this has an impact on export demand for the African uh, commodities and all other exports. We've also had an, an adverse impact on the tourism sector. Throughout this conversation uh, we have had in the last two days, the issue that has been also uh, merged quite in a number of uh, discussions is the issue of the rising debt burden with the more countries slipping into debt distress. And we have also seen like uh, across many countries, we've seen the rising debt to GDP ratio and the debt servicing uh, burden has been going up. During the discussions, it was noted that uh, it is important that we, we need to think that we need to rethink the international structure that underlies the, the, the public debt, especially the external debt. As African countries face much higher interest rates compared to other regions. Due to this increased uh, private external debt at high premiums, this has contributed to elevated, elevated, elevated debt and debt service burden for most of the African economies. It was also noted that there has been contraction of government revenue, remittances, and FDI across a number of African countries. In some countries, inflation is going up. In terms of trade, we had very lively discussions, particularly as presented by Dr. Stephen Karingi of UNECA, who actually gave us um, some of the issues or impacts that have have occurred in the trade sector. And generally of importance to note is the fact that Africa trade has been mostly affected by the decline or collapse of commodity prices and cross-border restrictions, especially immediately after the emergence of the pandemic. Nonetheless, Africa's intra-trade has shown some resilience and it was not as adversely affected in comparison to the inter-trade with the rest of the world, which is good. However, it was noted that due to the border restrictions, the town, 
that the small towns are across the borders and also the cross-border inflows, especially the informal, informal trade was adversely affected. African governments were already facing limited fiscal space and hence they have lower financial resource capacity in terms of resource mobilization, particularly given the weak domestic tax revenue mobilization and the contraction that has been witnessed in FDI and remittances. Basically, all these indicators are pointing to the fact that attainment of the SDGs is now more challenging than before. We've also heard from our emerging preliminary evidence from the ongoing research studies at UNWIDA and also rapid surveys that have been taken uh, at the household level from select African countries that indicate that there is a rising inequality and also poverty, both at the household level and at the national level. These uh, surveys and uh, emerging evidence is pointing to the fact that there have been reduced household income, particularly following the lockdown measures and the temporary closure of businesses that was undertaken in many countries. There have been increased incidences of gender-based violence and, uh, uh, in, in most of these economies due to, due to the uh, pandemic. Now, going forward, as we all know, there has been a lot of efforts towards uh, vaccine. So there is a ray of hope. However, it was also noted that there are gaps and Africa is generally lagging behind. But all is not lost. There are opportunities. These opportunities include import substitution avenues that African countries can tap into to promote the growth of manufacturing sector and the industrial se sector in, in general. For example, investment in local pharmaceutical industries, textile and apparel, through the increased opportunities to produce PPEs and other related uh, 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 products owing to the pandemic. There are, also, there, there are also opportunities to diversify towards the technology sector, and there are opportunities to enhance local assembling of raw materials. As we witnessed during the pandemic, there was quite a challenge due to the restrictions and border closures to assess the import and the capital, imported capital goods and intermediate goods, especially that affected the manufacturing sector. So it's high time that now African countries took advantage of this to try and at least produce some of these materials locally. In general, the, the pandemic provides us with an opportunity to enhance capacity and ability to innovate. And hence, part of the solution lies in utilizing the digital, technolo digital technology and the ICT sector, the, which are expected to play a fundamental role in fast tracking Africa's recovery. Already we have examples like countries in Kenya, like countries like Kenya, where there is a lot that uh, there has been a major shift towards a cashless, cashless uh, transactions uh, and digital finance and electronic payment systems. Other opportunities include the African free continental trade area, which holds great potential as pathway to trade diversification, industrialization and, and the boosting of Africa's trade. How about the role of development partners? Just before this, uh, uh, the preceding session, we had that the development partners need to safeguard the continuity of programs and they need to factor in more flexibility and enhance the role of local actors. The key words are adapt, adjust, and response. Thanks to the pandemic, we have witnessed an intensified coordination 
across the development partners. There has been rapid response from development partners. For example, the debt suspension, debt service suspension initiative by the G20, the COVAX, and also uh, efforts uh, towards COVID-related uh, financing by African Development Bank. However, modalities to mod mobilize additional resources are still needed, especially towards humanitarian aid, debt, and vaccines. Going forward, a more unified multilateral approach is needed among all the development partners. Global community need to ensure that vaccines are made available to everyone, as no one is safe until everyone is safe. We need to leverage on other resources. As it has been pointed out, we still have uh, a lot of avenues, for example, through the domestic resource mobilization, such as domestic capital markets, which we, could, which we can use to take advantage of the vast liquidity that exists in some of these e economies. More importantly, is also the need to address the solvency challenges, given the fundamental debt challenges that African economies are experiencing. We need to have a conversation, both by the, from the creditor side and the debtor side, as the solutions lie in a unified uh, approach from both sides. The G20 debt suspension, debt service suspension initiative is good, but it's not adequate, it's not enough. The conversation should involve both Paris Club and non-Paris Club creditors. As we address short-term issues, it's important that we also take critical measures to address the long-term development challenges that are afflicting African economies. We need post-COVID-19 recovery economy strategy underpinned around the fourth industrial, in the fourth industrial revolution. The key, the key factors to consider going forward as we forge towards the post-COVID post economic recovery include the following. The key role of institutions in form of institutional reforms are needed, for example, to overcome the coordination failures and to reduce the high risk profiles. Other measures include modernizing agriculture and as I already mentioned, the critical role of digitalization. For example, utilization of education through e-learning, e-commerce is going to be very fundamental going forward. We also need structural economic transformation. And particularly that to do this, we'll need capital accumulation by debt financed public infrastructure, for instance, as we need to accumulate, we need capital infrastructure to be able to transform the African economies. Ladies and gentlemen, all these things require great leadership. And so this has been pointed out that it's important to have great leadership, especially at the top, to be able to achieve all this. With these brief remarks, thank you very much for your attention. Now, my task was in two parts. So that is part one. And now I'll move to part two, which is to give the vote of thanks. So uh, just to, to start us off, some of you may not have been able to, to attend all the sessions since yesterday. But for you, for some of you who are not there yesterday, I'd like to let you know that we had very, very lively discussions from very eminent speakers. And above all, we wouldn't have had a better keynote speaker than Dr. Vera Songwe from the, the Executive Secretary of, of, of UNECA. So I'd like, and first and foremost, to start in, even in, in her absentia, to thank our keynote address, who 
despite her busy schedule, as you well know, at that level, to spare some time to be with us and all the preparation that had to take, took to, to, to prepare such a fantastic presentation. And we really appreciate and we, we hope that going forward, we are going to continue with this collaboration. I also want to thank the speakers. You'll agree with me that we had very fantastic speakers, well prepared, and it's not easy to prepare for such kind of uh, presentations. It takes effort and time. And I just want to say that from our perspective, we don't take that for granted. We really, really want to thank you all. And we have just had very uh, lively discussions. We have had very uh, insightful policy issues. And I hope that even going forward, some of the issues that we discussed here, we could maybe we could have a forum where they could be uh, picked up further even by our own very governments, because they are fundamental. We really want to thank all the speakers and the presenters. I'll not make names because they are, that will quite take us quite time, but we really appreciate. I also want to like, like to thank our, our very own UNU director, Professor Kunasen, who has been with us from the planning from the initial planning of this conference. And also throughout, he has, give, he has given us a lot of support, institutional support and individual support. Kunal, thank you so much. And to all our participants, I mean, it doesn't make sense. We would have just come here and maybe spoke to ourselves, so it doesn't make sense without uh, participants. So we don't take your attendance for granted. We really want to thank all of you for being with us. And we also want to, uh, to let you know that uh, in case you're interested in specific sessions or you are interested in, in the, some of the presentations, just let us know and we are going to be sharing some of the presentations uh, that have been presented. Some of the speakers didn't have the maybe uh, physical presentations, but uh, we have also made, uh, we have also uh, recorded this conference. So it will also be available. We just want to thank you all for your active participation. I think in some sessions you even had more questions. And uh, unfortunately due to time constraints, we could not pick all of them, but please feel free. You can approach any of the speakers. You can also approach us and we can, we'll be able to, to, to get in touch with you in case you need any further follow-ups. And to my own, my own very colleagues, the conference team, Anna, Teresa, Brooke, you are just fantastic. I just want to thank you so all. I know that you've been working behind the, uh, around the clock to ensure that everything is going on smoothly. And as we all know that some of these technologies sometimes can fail us, but I'm very happy to note that I think we've had such a smooth uh, conference without hiccups. And so I just want to thank the conference team, the IT team at UNWIDA, you've done a fantastic job. And with those few remarks, thank you very much. Kwaerini, and in Kiswahili, Kwaerini means bye. Asante means thank you. Thank you very much, Asante, bye-bye. <laughs>